So, we start again with the last panel of our conference. And for this specific panel, I really want to thank deeply Michael, uh, because we have been done uh, together really huge work for uh, this whole conference. So, I know that there will be a big applause for the great people that we have in the panel, but first, uh, also I would like uh, all of you to make an applause for Michael. And we have now the final uh, uh, silence by power, anti-corruption journalist and whistleblowing facing violence and persecution. And this is also a topic that we at the Disruption Lab really care a lot. Uh, in the past, we have been also working a lot with whistleblowers. So I'm also really proud and honored to have here Stephanie Gibo and uh, um, also to have with us Pelin Unker, uh, that's uh, with their brave work, uh, also is making a change, I would say, in the history of journalism. So thank you both for being here, because uh, what you do is really strong, and it's really important, uh, especially because of the things that you go through. So thanks very much. And uh, in the same panel, we will also have uh, on video um, another really brave person from Azerbaijan, Khadija Ismailova, that uh, cannot uh, travel, cannot be with us also because of her work. And Michael is going to say more about her. Um, and we also will start uh, uh, the panel with showing the video of, uh, about the award of Daphne Caruana Galizia. Uh, that is the person that was uh, assassinated because of her work. Um, so it's a panel in which we have really great women and important stories. And I'm really happy to introduce Michael now that will moderate it. Um, he's uh, the communication officer at Transparency International and is working on project to enhance collaboration with investigative journalists and seek uh, stronger protection for European whistleblowers. He studied at the School of Oriental and African Studies at uh, the University of London and at the Boca Zici University in Istanbul. So thank you very much. I leave the word to you, Michael, and uh, again, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you Tatiana. And I'd like to thank the entire uh, Disruption Network Lab for all the incredible work that they've put into this event. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you all and I'm really looking forward to continuing this collaboration through the rest of the series this year and next. As Tatiana was saying, the title of this panel is Silenced by Power, Anti-Corruption Journalists and Whistleblowers Facing Violence and Persecution. The stories and themes that we're going to hear about today tie into a lot of what's already been said over the past two days. Uh, they tie into questions about security of sources, protection of journalists working on large data leaks, revealing cor corruption and offshore schemes. It also ties into some of the legal and physical threats that we've been hearing about that come with that kind of activity, and also the role of partnerships and special projects in creating security and uh, enhancing that work. We're very lucky to have two, three people that we'll hear firsthand from, uh, Pelin and Stephanie, as well as Khadija through the video. Before that, I wanted to, we thought, felt it was very important to start with uh, or to feature Daphne Caruana Galizia in this panel. Um, as Tatiana was saying, Daphne was assassinated in October 2017 as a result of her reporting. Last year, Transparency International gave, uh, awarded the anti-corruption award to Daphne, and as a result of, well, as part of that, uh, we produced this video that we're going to play now, um, which was part of the posthumous award of the, uh, to Daphne, um, so I think we can roll that.
So my mother was the first woman in Multas history to write a political column in the papers. She was also the first person to write using her own name rather than anonymously. So people wrote anonymously out of fear of, of violent reprisals at the time. It seems like any, any job, but to be able to do that in Malta required this incredible force of personality and this total conviction in what you considered right and what you considered wrong. It was always the same thing that motivated her. It was this sense of injustice and this sense of outrage, I think. So my mother grew up in a Malta that was really restricted. It was a really controlling state and growing up in that environment you either accept that as normal, as a way of living and you, you sort of work with it or around it or you, you just refuse to accept it. She refused to accept that it should be controlled by corrupt people and corrupt institutions and she set out to change it. The main reason that she started that blog was she felt very restricted writing for a newspaper that, like most Maltese newspapers, is editorially quite conservative in what it allows its writers to say. So before my mother was killed on the 16th of October last year, she was working on four major stories. The people who my mother was reporting on, they're still there. Um, they're still, you know, they're still in government, they're still part of the state apparatus and they have little interest in a much broader inquiry into what happened to my mother. So there are a lot of interests working against justice, unfortunately. Some of the people who my mother investigated as a journalist are now involved in her own murder investigation. So it's hard to have confidence that everyone has a shared interest in uncovering what really happened. We are hoping that this inquiry looks more seriously at what happened to Malta, what happened to Malta so that it became a place where you can detonate a bomb powerful enough to take down a skyscraper on a Monday afternoon. And I think we in Malta really need to look at what happened, why we have become so systemically corrupt. We need to start recognizing corruption as really a major defining problem of our time. It's literally costing lives and we need to talk more about this. Thankfully, more and more journalists through the Daphne project, they are banding together and they are, they are taking a stand against these attacks. And I, I hope that governments and all institutions that can and should do something about this also join in this fight. I think that if my mother were alive to receive this award, she would feel a sense of relief, first of all, that other people also care. Other people care about her and her work, and other people care about the issues on which she's reporting, that she isn't, in fact, alone in this fight. I would want my mother to know just how important she is as an individual, just how incredibly powerful she is and continues to be, and that she really set an example not just for my brothers and me but I think for a large part of the world. I would want her to know that she will continue to provide that example and that she will continue to be a deeply loved and valued human being. Uh, we'd invited Matthew Caruana Galizia, the brother of Paul, who we saw in that video, um, and who was featured quite prominently in the Panama Papers documentary we screened yesterday. Uh, we'd invited him here today um, to talk more about his mother's work and the situation in Malta afterwards. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it, but he did send a statement, um, some words from himself, his brothers, Paul and Andrew, um, which I'll read out. 
It says, 18 months after our mother's murder, there is still no justice for her or for her stories. Journalists covering, covering corruption and organized crime in Malta are now more at risk because they live and work in a country where a journalist has already been killed. In a global climate of deteriorating safety, there is nothing more urgent than state action to secure journalists' working environment. Full justice for our mother will help secure safety for all investigative journalists. A public inquiry into the circumstances of her assassination is the only way to rule out institutional neglect or state complicity in her murder. And it is the only way for the Maltese state to learn how to prevent another journalist being killed. There is no justification for delaying full justice for our mother, and there is no justification for leaving journalists at risk. There's really nothing I can kind of add to that. Um, but I do just want to highlight one thing in the video that I think uh, sets up some of the discussion uh, we'll have with Pauline and Stephanie. Um, and that's to do with uh, collaboration and networks between, um, between allies in this area. Uh, Paul in the video mentioned the Daphne project, which was a collaboration by 45 journalists uh, in 18 different news organizations working to complete the stories and the investigations that Daphne had started and to make sure that uh, justice is served for um, uh, the people implicit in those. It also has another function, this kind of project, and that's to make silencing journalists or whistleblowers or truth tellers not only ineffective but actually completely counterproductive and um, I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind and in a sense that's I think part of um, the rationale of this panel. Um, so without further ado um, I'll introduce Pelin. Pelin Unker is a freelance investigative journalist contributing to Deutsche Welle Türkçe she works at, also worked at Cumhuriyet newspaper in Turkey for 10 years, working mostly on Turkish economy, analyzing data, and investigating privatizations, tax evasion, public contracts, and economic regulations. As a member of ICIJ, Pelin worked on big investigations like the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers, and her work has been awarded by Transparency International Turkey and the Progressive Journalists Association. Pelin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, first, uh, hi, thanks for coming. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for invitation again. Um, I am a member of ICIG of one year and I worked on Panama Papers and Paradise Papers. Uh, Van with Fitzgibbon from ICIG called me and asked, do you have time for, for work on a new huge leak? I was pregnant and uh, on my maternity leave, so I have a lot of time to uh, investigate something. And I said, yes, um, so I could find something critical. Uh, my big story is based, based on Paradise Papers is about ex-Prime Minister Sons companies in Malta. And now I will tell what this story about is. Yes. First, we look at numbers uh, on Paradise Papers. And the data is 1.4 terabytes covered by Sudoche Zeitung and shared with ICIG. And uh, there are 382 journalists work on it from 96 media outlets and uh, 67 countries. And there were uh, 126 politicians from uh, 47 countries, but only two politicians sued the journalists, and they are all from Turkey. Not surprisingly. And uh, who is Binali Yildirim? Let's look at his, him. Uh, Yildirim is a long-standing and faithful ally of President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. When the system changed uh, in the country, his duty is over, but he was so happy to be last Prime Minister of Turkey. He's proud of, proud of that. 
and his sons uh, have <laughs> Erkam Yildirim and Bülent Yildirim have five companies in Malta. All of them are shipping companies. Uh, Dertel Shipping, Nova Warrior, Havke by Marine, uh, Black Eagle, and South Seas Shipping. But not only brothers uh, were in the league. Bineli Yildirim's uncle and Nipi also was in Malta. And uh, the uncle had two companies in Malta. His nephew also uh, a director of four other companies. We can say at the end there are full family are there, and like ship tycoon. Uh, but uncle and nephew didn't sue me, only uh, the sons and Bineli Yildirim sue me. And why is Malta? Uh, because Malta has a far uh, lower corporate tax rate than Turkey. Uh, the tax rate is about 5%. In Turkey, it is 25%. And so they are in there. And <laughs> when we look at uh, Bin Ali Dirm's Twitter account, we are very surprised. We were because uh, his account is... Um, Following four accounts, uh, one of them is IKP official account, the other one presidency uh, official account, and uh, of course uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan's accounts. Uh, and the last one is the uh, president of Malta, Maria Luze Kadirov. <laughs> so uh, this shows why is Malta is very important for the family also. And after the publication, uh, Bin Ali Yildirim made a statement to the press, and he said about Operation His Sons in Malta, he said, uh, this is an international job, and His Sons didn't any win any tender from government. He also called investigation for business operation of Sons. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, and when he showed the document from uh, 2008, uh, he said uh, his sons are tax champions in Turkey. And, uh, but I want to call their films uh, in Turkey uh, from the number that is registered of Istanbul Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the man on the phone said it is a supermarket uh, which sells construction materials. And so they don't even have a registered number. Uh, yes, uh, on the other side, Arkham Yildirim had received a tender from stage two of his company in Malta. This company was Nova Warrior Limited. And in the, on the document, we can see his sign, his sign signing documents. Uh, as a behalf of, of South Seas Shipping. And South Seas Shipping uh, is the owner of Nova Warrior Limited. And when we look at the International Maritime Organization records, uh, we saw that Nova Warrior uh, was using the same address with a Turkish film called Oras Denizcilik. And when we look at the uh, uh, tender records from Turkish government, we saw that Oras Denizcilik had won a research and shipping related tender from Turkish government in 2017. And it is amount of uh, almost seven million dollars. And Binali Yildirim was also in the shipping business before entered politics. Uh, his business partner was Salih Seki Çakır. And, <laughs> surprise, Oras Denizcilik is owned by Salih Seki Çakır. In the end, no investigation was opened for business operations of Sons. And in the parliament, motions by opposition parties demanding an investigation into Turkish politicians accounts in tax havens, as revealed by Paradise Papers, was rejected by AKP wards. But this is not the only reaction of AKP about tax havens in the parliament. 
In Turkey, we have a stage institution called MASAK. Uh, it means uh, Financial Crimes Investigation Board. And it researches uh, financial crimes and publishes regulations on prevention of money laundering and financing terrorism. Uh, Twelve years ago, uh, Masak stated that there are tax havens and jurisdictions like Malta, uh, Cyprus, and uh, Masak requests that from government to pass a law uh, and announce the, these uh, jurisdictions or tax havens, but nothing happened. And we can see the reason now. Uh, now, because IKP was the ruling party during that time, and the head of the cabinet, Binali Yildirim's family is Daesh. And so uh, his family profited from the fact he didn't pass the law. And why must be Turkish people interested uh, in this story? In Turkey, uh, there is a huge economic crisis, and uh, the solution is always high tax rates. Um, when we have to pay high levels of taxes, um, the, the prime minister's sons not have to, they can avoid to uh, pay taxes. And um, on the other side, government always called foreign investors to invest our country. And we have, because Turkey has a big saving gap, and always the reason not to, show, uh, not to do social investments is this. Uh, if some elites don't put their money to tax havens, jurisdictions like Malta or Cyprus, uh, the government can find enough money to um, pay for health care or education, um, can do more social spendings. That's why everyone must fight against this. In the end, nothing changed uh, after these publications. And uh, I was prosecuted on charges of uh, insult and defamation. I fined almost uh, 9,000 liras and sentenced to 13 months and 15 days. Uh, in other case, I am also punished by a pecuniary penalty and 30,000 uh, 30, liras for violating the personal rights of the Yildirim family. Uh, I was sentenced 30 months uh, earlier this year, and in the indictments it says, uh, I will continue to commit criminal act and break love. Uh, it means I will continue to do my job uh, as a journalist, because in my case, the accusation is uh, against journalism. Uh, because there is no lie, I didn't anything unreal. Uh, Bin Ali Yildirim had already accept uh, these companies are real. And it's about ethics of journalism. Um, but I'm not a brave person <laughs> or an, a superhero because I do only my job as a journalist, uh, what uh, other journalists do. Uh, in Turkey, these trials uh, like that are aimed at intimidating us, um, but journalists must, must continue their uh, jobs in Turkey too. In the indictment, uh, they blame me for drawing tax havens as a financial crime. And it's true, this is legal in Turkey. Um, but uh, what I did is opening a discussion uh, whether this is ethical. My case is now on appeal court. We are waiting the final decision. Although uh, there was no evidence about accusations like that, appeal court usually ruled the original try was lawful and approved uh, the convictions like an automatic mechanism. This situation tells us uh, that independence of institution is so important because in Turkey there is no independent judge and so there is no justice. And uh, last I said before, two politicians sued me uh, because of my story spaces of Paradise Papers. And there was also another case, the third case against me. 
Uh, I also discovered that Serhat Albayrak, uh, the brother of Berat Albayrak, uh, which is son-in-law of President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, uh, are in the leaks too. Um, they are uh, linked to the, their comp they have some companies and linked to the a uh, Turkish conglomerate called um, Çalık Holding. It was uh, the same judge in the case, and the accusation was also the same. It was again defamation, and so we accepted the same decision uh, in the end. Uh, but uh, we were lucky because uh, the judge had forgotten to admit the indictment in time. And she dismissed four months for preparing the indictment. And uh, so she announced the decision sadly. <laughs> She said uh, to Al Bayrax and Chaluk lawyers, I am sorry about that. Um, I have to take this decision. And the charge against me was dropped in that case. Yes, uh, but this is not uh, the worst thing for a journalist, I think. Uh, the worst thing for a journalist, in my opinion, an investigation that you prepared for months must reach the large masses and, but if you want to read my stories in Turkey, you see this page because the government blocked access of stories in a few days. Yes, this shows again why collaboration is so important. The governments can block access to new stories, but stories don't disappear. Uh, there are a lot of uh, newspapers that publish these stories too in the world. And that's the thanks to Frederick Obermeyer and Süddeutsche Zeitung, ICIGEN, of course, NGOs supporting me. And classically, journalism is not a crime. And I know, as a journalist, I am not alone. We can make our world better together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline, for that. And um, just before, Stephanie, your presentation, I just have a couple of questions I wanted to ask just now. Um, what's it like, I mean, obviously working in Turkey as an investigative journalist is incredibly difficult, incredibly challenging for a variety of ways. I mean, the lack of potential impact, the government's control over media, the court cases. But I was curious that in the absence of leaks like the Paradise Papers, uh, or other troves of documents like that. How do you work? How are you able to work in Turkey? What's the environment like for uh, like the availability of records to do this kind of work there? The, um, how easy is it to access records? Are there registries for uh, company information, the kinds of resources that you'd rely on for uh, investigative journalism? Is it what are the other challenges, I guess, apart from the legal ones? Uh, yes, uh, a little bit more difficult, we can say, because uh, you cannot reach uh, some companies uh, to the, from the official uh, government uh, accounts, and so uh, you must do some things, uh, something um, different about uh, for investigating it. Uh, do double check about that uh, because uh, I said uh, th there was no, no uh, phone number in uh, Istanbul Commerce <laughs> and so um, people can do some things uh, illegal uh, very very um, easily in Turkey and um, it's another challenge for journalists in Turkey and we can say we, we couldn't re we can't reach um, we are not, uh, we n don't trust, trust the officials uh, what we gave us. It can be a lie uh, because uh, the government always changed change the um, system and 
um, the data has always changed, and we cannot see the data. Uh, we, if we uh, can see the data now, on the uh, other day, we cannot see this, this data. That's the challenge for us. I, I hope I can understand, uh, I can tell about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, yeah, I think it really speaks volumes to the, um, uh, not the challenges, but the incredible work that you've been doing there. Um, uh, Stephanie, uh, I'll hand over to Stephanie Gibault. Um, Stephanie Gibault was working at GBS Bank uh, in France for 12 years um, before blowing the whistle uh, on offshore schemes there. She's the author of the book Whistleblowers, The Manhunt, published in 2017 with an introduction by Julian Assange. In 2018, she was a jury member of the GUE NGL Award in honor of Daphne Caruana Galizia and will also be a jury member in 2019. Stephanie, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, before I start, I would like to thank uh, Tatiana and the whole uh, team for inviting me. Uh, and uh, as I worked for event management, I know exactly the amount of stress, the amount of work, and that uh, details matter. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the people who are in the room, actually, because I remember doing a couple of presentations a couple of years ago with whistleblowers, and we were two or three on the stage, and there was only one person in the, in the room. So it means that somehow, year after year, Months after months, week after week, uh, whistleblowers and journalists and associations have helped raise awareness about uh, the importance of hidden information. So my story is, <laughs> is the story that you would not even um, think of for your worst enemy. It's been lasting for 12 years now starting in yeah, 2007, 2008. And uh, the first uh, speech I gave uh, publicly in, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know if you know of TEDx. Uh, I, I did a TEDx, but before that I did something in French called l'échappé volé, which is the same thing, you know, you are alone on stage. And I asked the people who had an offshore account and obviously uh, no one put their hand up. And I said, but you know, it's not necessar necessary to go to Switzerland or to the Cayman Islands or to go to Jersey or to London or to Hong Kong. You just go down the street and there you go. So my story is uh, the following. I was working for uh, UBS, United Banks of Switzerland in Paris, and I was the um, public relation manager. Uh, most of my uh, time and budgets were devoted to the organization of events, of platforms for clients and prospects, potential clients. And uh, UBS opened in Paris first, and uh, then they developed uh, the network of offices all over the, all over the country. And my job was to provide to the bankers uh, the opportunity to meet with people and obviously to have uh, new clients at the bank. Uh, for uh, all of you who work in events management, uh, what you have to do is to make sure that the brand, and for me it was the three letters of the bank and the three keys of the UBS, um, to be in people's mind wherever they, whenever they were talking about their money which means that instead of thinking of uh, Deutsche Bank or of <laughs> BNP Paribas, they would think UBS. So during 10 years, my job was to uh, organize those platforms, which could be uh, sport events, like uh, boxes in uh, football stadiums, in uh, uh, tennis tournaments, like uh, private uh, evenings at the opera, because the problem with this type of clients type of uh, yeah, prospects is that they can buy everything they want. So the main uh, issue I had to face was to provide them with events that money cannot buy. So you talk here about emotion. So what is emotion? It's like a private dinner with 
whoever singer. Uh, it's uh, top-notch events that you cannot get if you are not UBS. Uh, for example, I don't know if one of you here has a Ferrari. If you own a Ferrari, you cannot go and drive your Ferrari in Maranello. It's impossible. But with UBS, you can. So you see, this is kind of details I was working on. So I was working like a dog because I had up to 100 events to organize per year. So can you imagine what it is? It's like I was seeing hotel rooms and uh, uh, planes and trains much more than I was seeing my own kids uh, to make this bank be uh, the most renowned bank in my country, in France. And one day, uh, in uh, 2008, uh, my new boss entered my office like a crazy, like a crazy one, explaining to me that a search had taken place in the office of the general manager, and uh, she was asking me to delete all the files, all the archives I had about the events I had organized since I joined the bank 10 years ago. So for me, it sounded quite weird, and I didn't really pay attention to what she, she asked me. But I was uh, really anxious about the search. What is the search about? What? When a search takes place in the office of a general manager, obviously there is something weird. Um, but as I was busy organizing an event with my colleagues in Geneva, I didn't really pay attention to what she said. And then the story uh, started. She came back in the days and weeks that followed, asking me if I had deleted those um, computer uh, archives, and she asked me to delete the contents of my paper archives, um, which is, you know, you were talking about your job, for example, it's as if you had uh, your manager coming to your office and asking you to delete all the contents of all the articles you had been written since you were a journalist. Somehow it doesn't make sense. And uh, I just felt by that time that they wanted to get rid of me. Why? Was I, you know, not efficient anymore? Was I to be replaced by someone who would be more um, accurate? Well, anyway, pressure started, and uh, for uh, the ones of you who have heard about uh, harassment, uh, I wish <laughs> you don't have to go through that, because it turns your life into a nightmare. I had uh, a depression, obviously, and it took my whole life away, because uh, we're talking here about whistleblowing. So I went and talked to all the managers of the bank in Paris, to the HR manager, to the... Uh, head of legal and compliance, to the um, president, and to all the ones I had to refer to, and they were telling me that, you know, I was tired, that um, everyone was complaining about my behavior, that um, I was making up a story, because I joined the bank when it opened in Paris. So I knew all the people who arrived. And uh, in 2008, there were 500 people at the bank, namely 150 of them were my internal clients, the bankers, uh, whom I had to please with those events. And some of them heard about the instructions I had to, to delete my files. And they are the ones who explained to me what my job was made for. As silly as I was and as naive as I was, because if you go back 2008, who was talking about tax evasion? Who was talking about tax paradises? Who was talking about the crucial role of Switzerland within Europe? Who was talking about Luxembourg, Ireland, Jer Jersey, the Cayman Islands, etc.? Nobody. But all of a sudden, with the crisis in 2008, you had uh, so many other um, scandals about UBS, all of them relating to tax evasion, tax paradises, and obviously the role of banks. Tax evasion couldn't exist if there were no banks, if there were no bank transfers, no bank rise. So in 2008, after uh, having uh, this instruction to delete my files, which I never did, 
uh, I had those bankers explaining to me that my job, which was a kind of a PR representing um, the image of the bank, helped the wealthy clients to open offshore accounts in Switzerland. And I was like, but I know, because Swiss bankers are part of our uh, commercial teams. They can come and see their clients here in Paris on the, on the dedicated floor. And I organize all the events with Geneva. So on all the golf tournaments, whatever I was organizing, there were Swiss bankers. What, what is the problem? We refer to the Banque de France. We have our own authorities. If there had been anything wrong, obviously the authorities, the Banque de France and all the investigating uh, companies would have heard about that. And this is somehow the other side of the coin. Is, and you all talked about it, Frederick, uh, Nicolas, yesterday, etc. Is that on one side, you have banks helping customers, clients, to evade taxes. But on the other side, you have governments and administrations who close their eyes and who somehow are extremely... Huh, how to put that, <laughs> uh, keen on closing their eyes uh, for reasons you have all explained uh, since yesterday. So, to make a long story short, because I can talk for six months, uh, I, I wrote two books about it. So, my life at UBS as of 2008 started to be a nightmare. The only thing I was able to do, because I was like, you know, an animal being tracked. I was extremely stressed. And uh, to go back to subject where uh, Frederick talked earlier, I don't know where Frederick is. Where's Frederick? Um, I fully understand why John Doe is John Doe and we cannot know who he or she is. Because being a whistleblower, the media, and if there are journalists here, I would be interested in talking about that. It's very important. It's not someone who wants to be in the media and wants to become a hero. We have information to provide because it's of general interest. We are not talking about being, uh, you know, like in a movie or like in a comic book, because when you watch a movie, then you have a remote control and uh, the movie is over. When you close a book, the story is over. But uh, then it's our lives being totally hijacked by information being published. Uh, it's, uh, I said to a conference uh, earlier this year, it's w w when a whistleblower meets a journalist, it's exactly like a patient with a cancer would meet with a surgeon. Somehow the journalist has a life between his or her hands. So nowadays things have... Um, Things are a little bit better, but 12 years ago, I can tell you that this was absolutely unknown from everyone. So anyway, uh, in 2008, I didn't delete those information. I had those bankers explaining to me that my job was helping uh, French clients to open uh, bank accounts in Switzerland, which were uh, undeclared up to 95%, and that obviously it's illicit. So I was somehow trapped with an information because as long as I didn't know, I obviously could not do anything. But I was a single mother raising my kids and I was like, but what if the police comes one morning at home and takes me away in front of my kids at 5 a.m. with handcuffs? So I was in a state of panic saying like, okay, I have everyone against me at the bank, including the bankers, obviously. I have no support from the elected members, from the personnel. I was myself an elected member of the personnel, so I asked all the questions to management. <laughs> and they were kind enough to send letters to each of the management saying, this is Stephanie Gibault's talk, we have nothing to do about that. Um, you know how people turn their, turn their backs. Uh, so I went and saw the Ministry of Labour, because in France it's supposed to be quite uh, 
powerful. And after six months meeting one of the ladies, she said to me, Madame Gibault, you're going to fill in a complaint against your employer. I was like, what? Yeah, you are going to fill in a complaint for tax evasion, money laundering, double accounting. Well, everything you've been telling me for six months. But I was like, are you kidding me? I'm a single mother. The only income I have is my salary. What is going to happen to me? And the answer I, I got was like, we are here to protect you, which is very important. And uh, so I remember, uh, for the ones who know Paris, uh, it's on Lille de la Cité. I arrived there on a December morning, I remember, with a pile of document as high as that. Uh, and by that time, I was still thinking like, okay, it's going to take six months, then the bank is going to go to court, all the managers are going to be punished, and I'm going to have another life because what I'm saying is true. <laughs> and my story is just making meeting, um, mistakes everywhere because I was the first one going to court in 2010 where I was still an employee of the bank because um, obviously justice is a mean of retaliation. When you are a single person, when you are a citizen, going to court is something extraordinarily violent especially if you are honest, especially if you tell the truth. And I had the general manager, remember, behind my back, who was jumping like a, a kangaroo saying, this woman is a liar, we've never evaded, helped clients evading taxes, all our auditors, and I don't know who talked about the PwC and uh, Deloitte and the other um, um, uh, audit companies earlier today. Uh, well, anyway, so this was the one of the first um, terrifying story I had to leave. But the following year, I was still at the bank, still harassed, still uh, in a cupboard, because uh, the Ministry of Labor refused my being made redundant, because UBS tried in 2009 to make me redundant, she refused and she let me in the bank that was frauding, helping clients evade taxes, the fraud of which I blew the whistle on. So somehow it's something totally unbelievable. And on my way to a tennis tournament, the Roland Garros tennis tournament in 2011, I got a call on my cell phone uh, private number. It was uh, the voice of a lady who said to me some thing where I understood that she was working for the Ministry of Finances and that she wanted to see me. And I uh, was uh, quite surprised. I said, well, I'm working on the tournament. It's two weeks. I work weekends, uh, evenings, um, bank holidays, I'm not available. And she said, yes, it's very important. So I met this woman, and this is where another kind of nightmare started. Um, these people uh, explained to me, because she was accompanied by, by other people, they explained to me that they were part of a customs um, department within the Ministry of Finances, and that fraud at UBS continued. And I was like, but are you kidding me? I blew the whistle instantly. I've been retaliated for uh, three years. They took my job away. They give it to a girl who's half my age because her parents have bank accounts at UBS Geneva. <laughs> and um, I went through a depression, and as I am an elected member of the personnel, uh, they ask us to, send, uh, to sign a new document saying that the foreign bankers cannot visit uh, their clients within our premises anymore. And I am going to be in Roland Garros, and I can tell you I have no Swiss banker on the list of guests. And they said to me, we are going to follow you during two weeks, and we are going to have photographers and teams who are going to follow you everywhere you go. And I was like, but you're mad. Fraud has stopped, I'm sure. And to make a long story short, during a whole year, 
even 15 months after this uh, tournament, I had to go regularly to their offices and bring upon their request, and this is obviously very important, information belonging to the servers of the bank, which meant that um, it was information that was not necessarily belonging to me at marketing, communication, and events. I guess UBS, who by that time was hacking my phone and uh, who had the possibility at least to hack my phone and my emails and etc., uh, enjoyed that to kick me out of the bank. And I left the bank. I was uh, like, um, you know, a, a nobody. Um, and I was thinking that I would you know, find a job after I would recover. And suddenly, the story reached the media. So now, in 2019, I have two questions. Who gave my name to those people in the Ministry of Finances? But who gave my name to the media? Who has leaked my name? If I was uh, called uh, Jennifer Smith, I would have found a job. Uh, being called Stephanie Gibault with this story uh, glued on me. Uh, as if I had never been anyone in my life but the UBS whistleblower, um, took my whole life away. Um, I took UBS to court on 2015 regarding the harassment I suffered. And another part of the um, terrible violence of what whistleblowers do is that I won versus UBS. It was a three-year trial. Uh, but somehow the money I made was not even the amount of what I had to pay the lawyers. So somehow it's also part of a very strategic uh, uh, harassment. But worse than that, the, worst, the week after I went to court, uh, we got the judgment, my lawyer uh, called me and said he had just spoken to UBS and I was really wondering why, because UBS uh, filled in another complaint against me for defamation for my first book, because I published the first book uh, explaining everything I just talked to you about in details. And I was like, and what, what do they want? It's even uh, worse enough. And he, he said, you are going to remove the complaint you filled in in 2009 against the bank and they will remove this complaint against you. And they will write to you a check of whether it is 50 or 100,000 euros. And I was like, but when a lawyer says that to you, you can also wonder what ethics is, because we're here to talk about whistleblowing, so ethical procedures within banks. But when you see how ethical lawyers can also be when you are somehow the scapegoat or you are being uh, uh, treated as if you can be paid, uh, you, you can get money for your information, there is some, for, for justice and legal information, it's absolutely crazy. Uh, so I refused. And um, 2016, thanks to the Panama Papers, here we are again. I was invited by France Television, which I think is one of the ICIG uh, media member. And they had invited the Minister of Finances, called Mich Michel Sapin, for the ones who know who Michel Sapin is. And I faced the Minister of Finances. It's totally, my life is totally crazy. And behind me, I had a screen like that with the Panama Papers, and it was whichever account, UBS, Panama Papers, you know, whichever account, UBS, 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 UBS. And I was like, what? everything goes around. Every, everything is linked. It's because I had obviously nothing to do with the Panama Papers. Uh, and the Minister of Finances was here, like every um, minister says, I want to protect whistleblowers. Whistleblowers are um, 
are the heroes of modern times. I am going to pass a law, so now it's called the Sapin Law in France, uh, to protect people like Stephanie Gibault. And the journalist said, but what are you going to do to her? Uh, how are you going to help her? She's going to be kicked out of her apartment. She hasn't had uh, incomes for five years and she's not going to see her kids anymore. And he answered, but I am unable to do anything. So this is, and then I will stop talking because I can talk for years, but you know, we are here for the title which is Confronting Hidden Money and Power. And this is France the neighbor country, the center of Europe, which is not supposed to be uh, tax haven, and somehow, um, to close the story, uh, I had to go to court last year, again, uh, for the defamation, and uh, UBS this year in France got the biggest fine ever, uh, the amount of uh, the amount of which is 4.5 billion euros. So all the economic media have talked about that. Um, but the Ministry of Finances still does not want to recognize the work I had done for them, which means that those past three years I had to take the state to court. So now my enemy is not even UBS. My enemy is a French state, which made me work for them, which made uh, my whole life collapse, and which brought 4.5 billion euros in justice and 4.7 billion euros from hidden money that came back to the Ministry of Finances. And for that, you are um, treated as if you were uh, Mr. Nobody. And I think this is the big conclusion of the thing, whereas there are laws being passed. I don't know who talked about the Brussels law earlier today, but in France we have this Sapin law, we've been having it for three years, and obviously all the whistleblowers do not enter in the frame of a frame law. There always is something for us not to somehow match the requirements of what the justice would want. And this is a very tricky game because um, there is no one to help. There is absolutely no one to help. And this is what everyone has to keep in mind. So among the solutions, uh, obviously ethics is supposed to be everywhere with journalists, with associations, with banks, definitely, but with our civil servants, our top civil servants, and our top politicians, because it just blows away the life of someone, and obviously our kids, our family, and whereas everyone should be uh, surprised and um, support us, whistleblowers all are extremely isolated. Uh, I just published a book called The Whistleblowers, The Manhunt, because all the whistleblowers I met, whether they are in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal, in Belgium, here in Germany, uh, and in the US, whatever the laws are, um, they all suffer the same retaliation. Uh, you know, England, for example, and I will stop on that, is supposed to have the best laws to protect whistleblowers. And we have Julian Assange, who's been uh, locked in the embassy uh, of Ecuador for more than six years. Um, the cases in the US are extremely severe as well, knowing that the laws have been existing and it's in the constitution to blow the whistle in the United States. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I know there's a lot more that you could say, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions that, uh, from the audience that people would like to ask. Before we go to that, um, we'll play the video from Khadija Ismailova uh, from Azerbaijan. And um, I think your story is, in a lot of ways, the story of an individual up against incredibly powerful forces um, all around you. And 
uh, I think we'll see something similar from uh, Khadija in her case just now. Dear friends and colleagues, first of all, I want to thank you for having me here. I'm one of more than 10 Azerbaijani journalists who are banned from traveling now, and that's why I couldn't be there in person. So I want to start my speech with good news. 15 years ago, the world was much bigger for a journalist based in Azerbaijan. We lacked tools and skills to investigate foreign investors and companies appearing in our market, enjoying favorable position in the economy, winning public bids, acquiring licenses which were denied to their competitors. In 2008, when I was working together with one of our trainees on the story about telecom companies' ownership, we had to leave it unfinished. The real owners were three Panamanian companies. We didn't know how to dig further, and we stopped. In 2011, when I was already part of OCCRP team, they taught me how to use the scraped database, by the way, many thanks to Dan O'Hugan who scraped it, and dig for more information in Panamanian registry. I found the owners of the three Panamanian companies, which I was not able to identify back in 2008. The companies were owned by President Aliyev's daughters. This was years before Panama Papers hit the world, and the ruling family didn't expect that once closed databases will be accessible to journalists. They didn't use proxies for opening companies in Panama. Their own names were there. It was March 2012 when I was working on several other stories. I've learned that there was a hidden camera in my bedroom in the previous apartment. I have learned it through the blackmail letter, which ordered me to behave. I didn't. I did my own research and even found a man who installed the special cable connecting the cameras and the telephone company. They needed stable connection for continuing transmission. The serviceman who did the job was employee of the state-run telephone company. He said it was the order from the work and remembered the time of the work first or second Saturday of July, few days after the first Panama story, Azerfon story. This is just one example how collaboration helped journalists to uncover the highest level of corruption in the country. But then it was also an example of how the state structures and ruling elite worked together hand in hand to punish that journalist by intrusion into privacy, blackmail and smear campaign. This February, I won the case in the European court, proving that the government blocked the investigation of the crime against me. However, I'm yet to achieve justice in this case. This very case is also an anecdotic example of how the government used anti-terror legislation to establish the system, ensuring full cooperation of telephone companies with special services, even when they didn't have court orders for sur surveillance. I continued to work together with colleagues in Azerbaijan and OCCRP, uncovering first families, businesses in construction, other telephone companies, finding their assets in different countries. In 2014, the story proving that the ruling family was in fact partner of Telia Sonera in another mobile telecom company was the last one before my arrest. I found First Family's shares in the largest telecom company. Shares were hidden behind Panamanian companies again. This story was also continued by colleagues in OCCRP while I was in jail. They discovered that Telia Sonera in fact paid for those shares, bought them for the ruling family. This was one of the dozens of investigations carried out by my colleagues while I was in prison within the special project, Khadija project, in order to prove that silencing one doesn't silence all. About arrest, the charges were somewhat ironic. I had feeling that the ruling regime is projecting their crimes on me. After a year and a half of prison and trials, Supreme Court left me with two of those charges, convicted. Illegal entrepreneurship for working for foreign media as a freelancer without accreditation in the foreign ministry. The charge was not based on any law requiring that accreditation but I could not have the court to hear this argument. It also shows that the government considers journalism as a licensed activity. Since my release, I wrote to foreign ministry to seek a procedure on how a freelancer 
should be accredited. No response was given to me. Tax evasion. Second charge was implying that the Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, a non-profit US Congress funded organization is supposed to pay profit tax. And because I was their bureau chief for two and a half years in the past, I was responsible for those taxes. That's what the court said. Without going into details of the case against Radio Free Europe, I want to mention another irony. The official excuse of, for the case came from Azerbaijan's anti-money laundering authority. They applied to prosecutor general's office saying that they suspect money laundering is taking place in several civil society organizations and Radio Free Europe. With that one letter, a criminal case had been launched sweeping the independent human rights community of Azerbaijan. In 2013 and 2014, number of organizations were raided, NGO leaders, human rights lawyers were arrested with trumped up charges. The government investigators could not prove any of those allegations and actually European court has already decided on two of those cases that the arrest and criminal prosecution was politically motivated. This umbrella case, which was what government declared anti-money laundering operation, was in fact the political crackdown against civil society. The financial case against me was one of many criminal prosecutions carried out under the same operation. The government and parliament in Azerbaijan also acted together to close access to information for investigative journalists. Since 2012, ownership of the companies is a commercial secret in Azerbaijan. In coming days, Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe will discuss the money laundering efforts of the member states. The urgency of this discussion is prompted by the investigations carried out by journalists. Journalists of OCCRP, Berlingske, Guardian and a number of other outlets discovered money laundering schemes, so-called laundromat. Investigations revealed hundreds of billions worth illegal transactions. I was part of that investigation. So what did that investigation reveal? 2.9 billion US dollars have been handled by complex operations of the money laundering machine. Between 2012 and 2014, Azerbaijani ruling elite has pumped millions through four UK companies and their accounts in Estonian branch of the Danske Bank. What the money was for? Ministers sent their siblings petty cash. Hundreds of millions of dollars were transferred to offshore. European politicians were bribed and so on. Italian member of parliament Luca Volonte received more than 2 million euros to his accounts through the same money laundering scheme. The money originated from funds of Bulk Telecom LLC, a Baku-based li limited liability company. OCCRP has revealed that the owner of the company when the transactions took place was Rasim Asadov, close friend of Aliyev family and business partner of the first lady's cousin Mir Jalal Pashaev. Laundromat investigations revealed that the company, Bak Telecom LLC, used two laundromat companies and their accounts to transfer more than 1.4 billion US dollars. Four UK companies were officially owned by Azerbaijani individuals, one of them being an assistant in the bank, another one a driver in another bank. The real owners of the accounts are yet to be identified and the Azerbaijani government takes zero attempt to investigate the matter. No, not surprising considering who were the beneficiaries of the money laundering transactions. Speaking of fighting corruption, the laundromat was also used by chief anti-corruption officers family, companies owned by sons of deputy chief of the anti-corruption commission, Ali Nagiev, transferred through Metastar Invest, one of four laundromat companies, at least 1.5 million US dollars. One of the most interesting cases is the Ross Oberon export pay payments. The Russian arm exporter transferred around $29 million into the Metastar accounts in 2012. Part of the money landed in accounts of the company named Velasco in Cyprus and Hungary.
The company which received through Metastar about 9 million US dollars is owned by er Orhan Eyubov. Coincidentally, Orhan's father, Vice Prime Minister Yagub Eyubov, was key negotiator of the arm deal between Azerbaijan and Russia prior to transactions. The deal was widely criticized in media due to low quality and outdated nature of obtained arms. Small but interesting detail, Vice Prime Minister's health bills in the United States and Germany were also handled by Metastar Invest, the laundromat company. Azerbaijani officials prefer having healthcare services in Europe as the country's healthcare system is destroyed by corruption and monopolies. The officials in presidential administration were also aware of the money laundering companies. Azer Gassimov, the press secretary of President Aliyev, received four installments worth $130,000 through the scheme. Lobby firms in the United States and Germany were in the receiving end of the money laundering scheme as well, but also United Nations. Husband of then UNESCO Director General Irina Bokova also received laundromat payments. Edward Lindner, German politician, very well known in Azerbaijan for his restless support to ruling regime, also received a lot of money. Money landed in Lindner's accounts were later distributed to other politicians, including Karen Strenz, a Christian Democrat member of parliament then, and Alain Destek, Belgian MP. As I told earlier, Azerbaijani government made zero attempt to act upon these findings. No one is prosecuted. None of the officials have been questioned. Zero responsibility. While anti-money laundering agency was initiating a crackdown against civil society and journalists in 2013 and 2014, these schemes were operating in the heart of the capital, Baku. When law enforcement were busy making up cases against dozens of journalists, the public funds were siphoned through the real criminal hands. Until recently, there were 10 journalists behind bars. Now we have four remaining in prison. Dozens are banned from travel with bogus excuses. Azerbaijani government successfully cooperated with Georgian government for abducting and arresting investigative journalist Afghan Muhtardi two years ago. However, since 2005, the two governments cannot cooperate to investigate assassination of Elmar Hussainov, another journalist. The editor of Monitor magazine, Elmar Hussainov, was killed with five bullets in his mouth after publication of series of investigations about the ruling family. His alleged assassins are Georgian citizens, and Azerbaijani government doesn't find a way to request them from Georgia or to question them in Tbilisi. Impunity for criminals in office and punishment of truth-tellers pushes people into hopelessness and subsequently to religious groups. To religious groups who promise that the bad deeds and good deeds will be duly rewarded in the other world. There is a hope, though. There is a chance that the international justice may help to work. Usually, prosecutors don't act when we uncover corruption in Azerbaijan. Landermat investigation was the first time when I could see direct impact of our investigative work, although it happened only in, on European ends of the money laundering scheme. Criminal cases were launched in Europe, banks lost their licenses in Europe, prosecutors acted against money launderers in Europe, politicians lost their seats in parliament and became subject for anti-corruption investigation in Europe. Thanks to the fact that journalists and activists, namely Transparency International, worked together to reveal and then bring justice to the cases, we saw movement. It is important to build on this moment, hopefully, International organizations, which my country is a member of, will demand actions. They will demand to bring justice to real corruption cases in Azerbaijan, and they will demand Azerbaijani authorities to open the commercial registers for public watch. And there will be a day when those who beat, kill, blackmail, or arrest journalists will not enjoy impunity. Thank you.
just before we open it up to the floor for questions, I'd like to come back to you, Stephanie, about something that, um, uh, well, at the start of that video, Khadija talked about how the world has become a smaller place for journalists like her working in Azerbaijan, that the, the network opportunities, the collaboration are there. Um, as a whistleblower, what are the, in the legal cases that you're going through, the persecution you're facing, what are the networks, what are the support mechanisms that you're able to draw from? Are there any, or are you, do you remain isolated as a whistleblower? Oh yeah, for, te for 10 years it was, uh, it's been awfully, um, I mean, it's loneliness, and uh, somehow the cases are so tough in a country like France, because somehow it's terrible what, what the lady just said, but um, as we are in Europe, we were not expecting this at all. We were expecting support. We we're expecting, you know, people to, um, and especially the administrations, uh, to come with us to court or to forbid that those banks take us to court. And somehow, no, this is why we tried uh, to gather whistleblowers in France uh, twice in 2014 and 2016. And many people have sneaked in everywhere to make sure that this would not happen. This is why I, I published this, last, this book, uh, just for everyone to know that if we gather, it's gonna make things extremely uh, more simple for everyone because everything we say is always linked to the top politicians. I didn't have to, time to say, but in 2013 in France, we had a, <laughs> a crazy uh, scandal hitting the news with the Minister of Budget, who was himself fighting tax evasion, who had uh, bank, offshore bank accounts with UBS in Geneva. So, obviously, no one uh, understands that this is directly linked to my case. It was at UBS, again, as, as I said, UBS was in the Panama Papers, it was in the Paradise Papers. So, everywhere you find, well, your image of Jersey <laughs> was UBS as well. It's, it's a little world where everyone is connected. So, we have, we are the 99%. If we are uh, united, then we are going to be much stronger because we are the people. And Pedlin, if I can put a similar question to you regarding the um, the difference that collaborative work makes. I mean, working in the co the country that's the biggest jailer of journalists in the world, the, and coming up with it, working on an investigation like the Paradise Papers, how? What was going through your head in the lead up to the publication and the balance of what might come at you as negative consequences, but the support that was also there? How much does that help you go forward with that, um, with that process, that investigation? Uh, I think the um, most important thing is collaboration again, because uh, Daphne project is a good example for it. You can silence the journalists, but you cannot silence the new stories. And um, so the other thing is, uh, other important thing is um, for support, supporting is uh, very important. And um, you, uh, you must feel you cannot uh, lonely when you something uh, critical and uh, support for Turkey, for example, support from uh, European Union is very important because uh, European Union can change uh, Turkish government decisions. Can uh, it can be pressure on it like that? Uh, I think. Uh, but uh, on the other side. Uh, I must say something because uh, I think we must do as journalists in Turkey uh, the journalists also must do something locally because some uh, people call themselves journalists and doing only what government wants and uh, this is not uh, this uh, must be changed I think first and the, then uh, we can change 
by supporting from the other countries. I'll, <coughs> excuse me. I'll open it up for questions from the floor. Um, any questions for Pauline and Stephanie? In the front here. Yeah, thank you so much for, for, for that. Um, I wanted to ask about the defamation laws that, that were mentioned in both cases as tools to you know, crack down on both whistleblowers and journalists. And, and if you had any thoughts on you know, just what is the way forward with those in terms of like, preventing that abuse of defamation laws and, and what could possibly be done to sort of a, at a systemic sort of policy level to prevent that kind of abuse of power using, using legislation. In my case, uh, the accusation was defamation, but uh, there is no lie in my story. And uh, in the indictment, they said uh, people know tax havens and these ju jurisdictions is illegal. And so, uh, if you say in your uh, story, if you can say in your story uh, that is legal in Turkey, uh, people don't understand this, and uh, people think. Uh, people thi will think uh, they are doing a bad, bad job in other countries and so that's the reason of the defamation is uh, very uh, strange for this because uh, the prime minister accepts the companies, yes, we have my sons, he says, Yes, we, my sons had these companies, and then they said uh, I, I attacked their personal rights, and uh, these accusations came. Is it, is it true that one of the, the laws used was to do with defamation of a public official? The politicians have particular protection under the law as well in Turkey, I believe. Uh, the politicians usually the politicians usually use this. Uh, these decisions, because the judge are, judge are, judges are not um, independent in Turkey, and always when, uh, a, as a journalist, when you make a critical story, after that we know that uh, an accusation will, ca will come after this story, and uh, journalists in Turkey are always in courts, uh, we are seeing each other in courts and <laughs> like a meeting room now. And not, o not only journalists, academicians and uh, people from civil society and lawyers also in the courts. Uh, we can say uh, if you do a great job, if you are doing uh, your job well, uh, it can be uh, you are facing these pro problems like that and it's, uh, we can say it is an award from government. Stephanie, do you, want, do you have anything to add? This is a complicated question. If I take my case, uh, in 2010 in France, no one had ever heard the word, the word sorry, whistleblower. Whistleblower came into people's uh, minds thanks to the media as of 2014. So... I, w I, I did not know at all what I was facing. And obviously the big, 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 big mistake I made um, is, because you cannot go to court if you don't have a lawyer, uh, is to take a lawyer who was a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend and who obviously did not anticipate the whole thing I told you and the massive fraud uh, Ever because the, 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 the UBS fraud in France is the biggest they have ever seen. Um, the big problem as a citizen is to find someone who will defend your interest. This is what I said earlier, is like you go and see a lawyer as if you were a patient seeing a surgeon. Same for the journalist. So if you have someone in front of you who is not an ethical person, because then you discover that lawyers themselves are not necessarily uh, ethical people, which is another shock, you know. So nowadays this is public because people like me talk. But 10 or 12 years ago, you know, you were going to justice because justice is supposed to be ethical and fair. 
You don't know anything about that. Now, I have a lawyer who explained very clearly that, you know, if the two of us have a car accident or if we are neighbors and we have a water leak, justice is really fair. Justice will say, I am the guilty one, I must owe you whatever it is for damage. But a case like mine, justice is somehow unable because I have been to court, I think, seven times for the fine that is the biggest ever. And somehow I had to fight the government to recognize that I had been working with it. So I'm not somehow a whistleblower. I am a customs informant. And this is very different because uh, it enters a law that says that the people informing the Ministry of Finances for frauds are supposed to get a retribution. Um, so, you know, I am somehow um, huh, a student in law. I, I am learning because you have a civil uh, law, you have uh, financial laws, you have administrative law, you have... It, it, it never stops. It's not only a one way or a one window. It's all the windows are open, somehow for your case to be sent from one court to another. It's called a business. And there's your life in the middle, and this is it. I think there's a question here in the front on the left. Yes, um, I would be interested uh, from both of you. Um, I mean, we were talking, or you described how you were affected, I mean, negatively affected by what you did. Um, are there also any positive um, <laughs> effects? Like, I mean, I could imagine that uh, since you're well known, um, wouldn't companies offer you a job or um, maybe as an employee or not uh, also to to profit from your reputation as a whistleblower? I mean, or is that, uh, is that never happened? As far as I'm... Can you hear me? As far as I'm concerned, um, as I said earlier, I left the bank in February 2012. So I've been without incomes for seven and a half years, which means on one side paying lawyers, on one side being unable to pay the house rent. So the whole of your life goes away. What makes you a citizen is what? Is you have a job, so you have money to pay your rent, so you can raise your kids, so you can plan going on holidays, then you can change jobs, get a promotion, and then life goes on. With a case like mine, justice is the first element of the retaliation, with the government being the first one, um, you know, not respecting the laws. So how can you explain that anyone and everyone on the planet is able to contact me? I'm here in Berlin today, it's because uh, someone got my name or saw me somewhere. And like all the headhunters and all the companies who are, especially multinational companies, they are obliged nowadays in France to talk about um, uh, economy and economic and social responsibility. They are supposed to be the first ones coming to me. Well, I mean, when I say me and other whistleblowers who have been kicked out. And somehow they are the first ones who hide our stories. They don't want that. This is what I said earlier. It's as if we are in a movie and then everyone clicks on the, on the remote control and then everyone has their own life. So what is it for any of you to be without incomes for seven and a half years? What is it? You have no life. As uh, our president, Mr. Macron, said one day, uh, you go to the train stations and you meet people who are no ones. It's awfully violent, but this is exactly the way we are treated. We are nobodies. So we can only uh, uh, be... Uh, <laughs> we can only applaud with uh, the John Doe story because we don't know who he is or who she is, or who they are. And this is exactly it. Behind a whistleblower, you have someone's life. And we have the case of Chelsea Manning, who's back in jail. We have the case of Snowden, who is in Russia, as you all know. We have, I talked to you about uh, Assange earlier today. There is not a happy whistleblower who blah, blah, blah. It's not true. It's not true. And I was stupid or naive enough to think that it was only in France because France is a country where one doesn't talk and that in the other countries it would be better. But read my book, I left it at the entrance. The whistleblowers in Germany, 
it's a catastrophe. I went to the Bundestag three years ago and explained to one of your uh, member of parliaments uh, what it was like to be a whistleblower. She'd never heard about that. She had heard about the UBS fraud in Germany, because UBS had to pay a 300 million fine here three years ago. Uh, you go to Spain, you go to Italy, you go to Switzerland, which is a neutral country with all the multinational companies. Well, all the ones uh, blowing the whistle in Switzerland, the finance industry, prison. Prison. It's supposed to be the neutral democracy uh, of the world. We all, we all have heard that. So, no, no, this is not true. We're totally abandoned by the companies, by the headhunters, uh, and by our governments. Pevin, any, um, any positives that you can draw from your experience? Um, um, I have been working for Deutsche Welle now as a freelancer, uh, as a contributor. And uh, in Turkey, there is no headline media for uh, critical journalists. And uh, I am uh, a correspondent uh, working on um, finance, finance and economic issues. And now Berat Albayrak is economy minister of Turkey. And so uh, any media outlets can give me a job in Turkey. Uh, and. Uh, of course, I don't want to work with them also. And uh, I am a freelancer, as I said, and I, I, will, I, I can work some t Turkish websites. Um, but there is an uh, economic crisis in Turkey, and there is no good economic conditions. So many journalists now can do their job as a freelancer in Turkey. Very practical question to Stephanie. So you mentioned that when, when they came to you and asked you to delete all the fires in your computer, you're really shocked and surprised because you didn't know that something could potentially be wrong or that you're doing anything that could be um, illegal, right? Um, so one of the things we have been calling on, on banks to do is to train their staff, right? So they should, everyone who works in a bank, directly or not directly with a client, should know what is the bank allowed or not allowed to do, what are anti-money laundry obligations, and so on and so forth. So after this happened, and you were still in the bank for a while, did anything change in the bank? Did you see any change that the bank were actually training their staff or anything that you can tell us? I said, I said it before during my, my speech. I explained that uh, as of when I blew the whistle, uh, as an elected member of the personnel, they changed all the procedures. They change uh, the compliance uh, book. They change uh, the, the, the the practices of the bank, which was uh, that, for example, foreign uh, bankers couldn't uh, meet their uh, clients uh, in the bank premises anymore, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, they did. Of course, they did. But then the customs told me that fraud was continuing. And, uh, and I was the first one shocked because I said, no, I mean, this happened and da, 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 I'm suffering enough. So it was very interesting, by the way, because we had, we did a, a work trying to know how it would work. It was very interesting because it continues. I mean, I do not think that it's because we're in 2019 and that there are all these uh, uh, media talking about it that fraud has uh, stopped. Uh, what uh, bankers explained to me is that um, 10, 12 years ago, it was countries like Switzerland, where on one side you had banks and on the other side you had governments, which were stable democracies. Uh, nowadays, 12 years later, as they've moved the bank accounts with a click of a mouse, um, the jurisdictions, um, the countries uh, where the, the accounts are, are in countries where the state, the head of state and the banker is the same person, which makes things even um, more difficult because it's on one side money laundering and uh, money um, darkening. So it's, uh, it's a big washing machine, yeah. Any more questions? Come back to you. Yeah. One more question. Um, how do you comment, uh, what's your opinion on the recent EU regulation for 
in order to protect whistleblowers. Are you satisfied or not with that? You're talking about the law passed two weeks ago at the parliament? Yeah, two or three weeks ago, but very good. I mean, it's very good to have laws that somehow um, <laughs> are supposed to protect citizens. We have this law in France uh, since 2016, and people like me, who were exactly what the law says, like to talk to your hierarchy and to the top management and then to uh, fill in a complaint or then talking to uh, people outside, somehow blow the whistle externally. It's exactly what I did. And then uh, the Ministry of Finances says, oh, but you're not a whistleblower. Um, you are a witness we used in a case. So laws are extremely important as long as you have an ethical justice, because all the um, uh, MEPs in Brussels explain the same. Down the road, at the end, it's a judge deciding whether it's a Belgian judge, a Turkish judge, a French judge, a German judge. Then the judge is responsible for the case. So, of course, the laws are very good, and we are happy to have contributed to that, because if we hadn't been so noisy around our cases, uh, uh, it wouldn't have raised so much uh, awareness. And now, um, being a whistleblower is not something easy, because uh, obviously your phone is being tracked, obviously you are being followed. I had no time to talk about it. I, I wrote a whole book about my first, my story. My first book is absolutely crazy. Each time I was sitting in a restaurant or I was somewhere, there was someone alone next to me. It was never the same person, you know. And uh, then uh, when this lady from the customs uh, met me on the Champs-Élysées during the Roland Garros tournament, I said, but how are you going to recognize me? I don't know who you are. And she said, Mrs. Gibault, I've seen many photos of you. But you're like, so you know, we are never alone. This is what I discovered is like, uh, obviously, uh, a case like mine and corruption cases um, with links to our top politicians goes in the hands of the secret services. So those guys are the ones who are on your back. And I heard by journalists that somehow in 2008 uh, was given to uh, the police, the, the finance police in France, uh, the instruction to follow the ones who were against the practices of UBS, not the ones who were complying with the rules. So you're like, but who gives the instructions in my country? It, it's, it's crazy. So laws, of course, definitely, uh, as long as you have a very good lawyer who is able to identify uh, the potential problems. My first lawyer read my first book, and it's the one being attacked, and I think it's 35 paragraphs, so it's a massive thing. So either the guy is totally corrupted, and or totally uh, <laughs> unable to, uh, to do his job properly. But, you know, it's, uh, once again, it's, uh, it's, uh, laws are good, but it's according to who surrounds you. And the big problem is anonymity. As long as we don't know who's behind a case, obviously this person cannot be retaliated, cannot be harassed. Uh, you know, my dog was poisoned in my apartment one night. Uh, guys jumped on me at the corner of one street one night. You know, four guys and one of them was like a sumo, you know. I was totally petrified. Who was there to help me? Is there a justice? Is there, you know, a law that says... Uh, um, because who entered my apartment without breaking the door? Who poisoned my dog in the apartment without breaking the door? It's crazy. What, what is this made for, you know? So it's uh, pressures. And uh, in my case, but in many other cases, the Ministry of Finances had to offer me a job. I could have been the best person in the world doing communication for the Ministry of Finances, um, cheating, uh, you know, looking for tax evasion. Why don't they do that? What is the interest in keeping me in my situation? What is the interest in non abiding the law? Because in my case, it's the French administration who does not abide. There's a guy who's supposed to write a check, then it changes my life and I can go back to a normal life. Uh, somehow it's so much cruelty. 
it's not even violence, it's cruelty. You are someone of the civil society, you're middle class, and like everyone, you have a family, you have friends, you have a job, you have incomes, so you have projects, so you are happy. You have your health problems, your family problems, the little problems. We have massive problems. You know, when you're a woman and you don't raise your kids anymore, what can be worse than that? When you have an animal in your apartment and your, and your animal is being poisoned in your apartment, what can be worse than that? Uh, when you go to court uh, to have your own rights uh, being applied versus a government, who says that <laughs> they fight tax evasion? It, it does not make sense. And this is, I think, the big conclusion of all that. It does not make sense. They do not want whistleblowers anymore because the more whistleblowers there are, obviously the most information circulates. Yesterday there was a gathering in Paris for uh, Julian Assange in front of the, the embassy of uh, Australia and I listened to, to uh, interviews this morning and uh, people were saying but the fact that he still is um, uh, in this embassy alone locked in such a silence uh, is terrible for all of us because somehow this leads to the fact that no one wants to talk anymore and it's the retaliation is so terrible that we have to understand that retaliation against one is retaliation for all the others because tomorrow if you are the next whistleblower at UBS your case might be extremely similar to mine even if the laws have evolved and why? And the answer, we come back to Frederick and the ICIG and the Süddeutsche Zeitung, is we have to gather to have our own interests uh, respected. Because we all are down the road, it's a human question. It, what is it to live together? What is the truth? What's right? What's wrong? Uh, what is ethical? Uh, are our governments ethical? Are our administrations ethical? Uh, what can we do? Uh, all together, uh, silence is a violence. Uh, you know, in my book, I talk about 50 whistleblowers. No one had ever heard about them. You know, the, I was talking to you earlier about the German ones. And, you know, my blood froze because it's true. I went to the Bundestag and no one had ever heard about what a whistleblower was uh, three years ago. So, um, Thank you for being here, because you, little by little, are going to read, are going maybe to buy my books, and are going to think about what we can do together. But what the journalists are doing with the ICIG and, uh, and the Panama Papers is exactly that. Never be alone to face something like what we face. Because obviously, we know, I'm not in Azerbaijan, on, in countries where you would be found dead, you know, we're talking about uh, Daphne earlier. Uh, in France, it's a social death. Because obviously, if you have no incomes, then you have no money, then you don't see your family, that you don't have friends, that you don't have projects, then you are someone no one wants to be close to. And obviously, it's, it's so violent. So, um, the, um, yeah, the, 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 big, um, the big thing is laws to protect people like me, like you, like, uh, but it's also laws to take the other ones to jail and to prosecute them and to seize their wealth. You know the Minister of uh, Budget in France who was cheating taxes with UBS? He's not in jail. He plays golf every, every Thursday. Cool. So is it better to be this guy or is it better to be me? And what is fair, what is unfair, what is ethical, what is not ethical? So it's uh, philosophy questions, and it's also somehow wondering what historians will remember of our democracies at the beginning of the 21st century. Yes, I have a question for both of you. Uh, one for Pauline, uh, uh, because I know that you were uh, um, a in a trial already the 28th of March and I wanted to know uh, I mean if you can explain a bit more to the audience what happened there and also what are the trials that are still open for you so we can also understand a bit more what is the actual state of your case 
Um, and then for Stephanie, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, since we were mentioning uh, this uh, whistleblower protection law uh, that recently passed, do you think that that is going to change something or what do you think still really needs to be done uh, for whistleblowers to allow you to have a better life? Uh, I ca uh, my case is, is uh, that there are two cases about uh, defamation and one of them is Benelli of the Roman Sounds and uh, this court decision is uh, now on ap appeal court and there is no time schedule for it. We are waiting the final decision. Uh, in Turkey, uh, there is no guarantee about that. It is due to um, jail uh, management because uh, 13 months and 15 days in jail, normally I don't need to uh, go to in jail and uh, go to faced in uh, sentences and um, but I don't know uh, how many days uh, I have to go I have to be in jail I have to stay in jail now maybe a few days maybe a, one month or two months we don't know about that and the other case was uh, about Berat al uh, and his brother and uh, the same judge uh, was uh, there and so we accept, expected the same decision because uh, it was the same judge and the same uh, accusation. Um, but uh, I was lucky uh, on I was lucky for that because uh, the judge made a mistake. Uh, she dismisses the time. Normally, uh, in four months, uh, they have to prepare indictment uh, for journalists. Uh, but she dismissed time, and so the charge against me dropped. And uh, if uh, she didn't... Uh, forgot this time, uh, actually I, uh, I will again uh, face the same uh, decision. And uh, now I am waiting and uh, I am living in Turkey and uh, everyone uh, sometimes uh, they ask me why are you living still, why are you still living in Turkey? And, um, my, in my opinion, uh, I uh, don't want to change my life uh, because of that, because I used to my life and keep on doing something in uh, my country. Uh, some of journalists now are living uh, out of Turkey because they want to live in democratic cities. Uh, maybe they are right, but uh, in my opinion, we have to do something in our country for changing some things. And uh, uh, that's all what I can say. Thank you. And the question was about the law, right? The law in Brussels. Um, I think what should also have been added, but maybe it's going to steps. We're going to, you know, build later. Is that uh, companies and administration must have internal and external audits. This is rule number one, you know, because when I had the general manager of UBS behind me in 2010 saying, our accounts are being audited and she's a liar, she's a liar. Well, down the road, uh, the Ministry of Finances found 40,000 uh, offshore accounts for an envelope of 12 billion euros. So there is something which apparently uh, the auditors did not see. Uh, so I am like extremely... Um, uh, I mean, I, I underline this because it's very important. Uh, for example, I've never been audited at UBS. Why not? I had budgets up to five million, five, six, seven million a year. I mean, it's lots of money, you know, for to organize events. Um, and as I said before, the law must provide uh, prison sentences and the wealth despoilment. Because uh, if all the guys we have been seeing for two days, they were in jail and without money, then uh, it would be one of the uh, reasons why people wouldn't follow suit. As long as they have impunity. You know, we had this Minister of uh, Budget in, in Paris 
talking uh, to uh, the cameras and talking at the Assemblée Nationale, saying that he had never had, it was war that he'd never had. So if you are able to lie as much, it means you know you're going to have impunity somehow. So the laws are supposed to take those guys to jail and to um, despoil them. Obviously, I mean, it's, it's my feeling because otherwise uh, it's only honest people like you and I who have an idea of what, what's right and what's wrong. If there are no further questions, then please everybody join me in thanking once again Pele Nunkar and Stephanie Jabot for their presentations. So I really wanted to thank all of you uh, for this uh, really important panel and I also hope that what we discussed today you know, will be heard from the people that need to hear and also there will be some change. This is really the things we uh, try to uh, you know, engage with and also have as a hope for the future at the Disruption Lab. So I really wanted to thank you. And now I am here with Lieke to give a little announcement for the future, so uh, you, you <laughs> it's okay, otherwise you're getting, you know, thank you. Um, hopefully we wouldn't be too long, but um, uh, we wanted to announce what is going to happen tomorrow and also uh, what will happen in the future of the Disruption Lab, uh, so you would start. Yeah, I will talk a bit, well, you already heard probably the artistic talk today by RYBN.org. So tomorrow they're going to do a workshop um, with a selected group of people. Unfortunately, it is sold out. Um, so it is a workshop uh, about their offshore tour operator. So this is the psychogeographic GPS prototype that they developed, which they showed earlier in the, the rucksack. So people will be using this to uh, take a walk through Berlin and find, uh, yeah, um, some locations that are in the database of the Panama Papers and so the physical traces of the offshore banking and for all of you that cannot join the workshop but are curious like what's going to happen or what we will discover we will actually also be discussing the results and the things people found in the next community meetup so this will be happening on the 17th of April um, at the State Studio which is in Schöneberg so we will spend some time during this meetup also to discuss what we actually found and then I'll hand over, <laughs> hand over to Tatiana again to talk about other events that will be happening this year. Yes, um, I mean, we don't go into really the details because uh, as you imagine, to build up each event takes a lot of time. <laughs> so we cannot already present you the next program, but we can briefly say what we are going to work uh, on on the following uh, events. And as I say, we will always work uh, in partnership also with Transparency International. Uh, the next uh, event will be in June 14 and 15, and uh, we will work on the inequality of AI. Uh, so as everybody now, <laughs> we also want to try to put our head into the discourse of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and at the same time, the form of inequalities that uh, also machine creates, especially if we, we speak about uh, racial discriminations uh, and also other kind of discrimination related to gender, class, uh, and so on. Then in September uh, 20 and 21st, uh, uh, we will have uh, another event that is related to uh, citizen journalism, so in a sense really connect to the one we just uh, experience in these two days, uh, but we want to analyze the situations in which the citizens and the normal people are somehow uh, doing the work of the truth tellers by helping journalists uh, and also uh, researchers uh, uh, 
other people that uh, want to engage uh, in, in a revealing form of misconducts and uh, we also want to involve people that are really good uh, uh, in uh, technical terms so that are also creating tools for enabling this form of uh, grassroots uh, whistleblowing if you want and uh, then uh, uh, in November we will have the community conference yeah, so I'll briefly, yeah, I don't need to, no, there's nothing, <laughs> no, there's nothing <laughs> yet, so this is all to be developed during the year, so actually in the end of the year, so on the end of November, we will have our final event of the year, which is called Activation, and which is not a regular conference, but a, a sort of community gathering, so as I said before, we have this community meetups happening now before and after each conference, and at these meetups, we also look at the topics that are discussed in the main conference, so we had one meetup already about the Dark Havens, offshore tax evasion and we have another one coming and we will use these these meetups and what we discuss there to prepare the program in November so in November we will have input on each of the three topics throughout the year but from the community perspective so everybody is also invited to join these meetups and get, share your ideas because we really want to develop this also together with the community that is around the disruption network lab and this we will then use in the activation conference to close off the year together with the final reflection on these topics mm -hmm. and uh, we will do the conferences always here at the studio one and uh, the community conference too but uh, the activation uh, meetups will be at the state studio in Schoneberg and uh, so now we arrive at the end of our conference okay there is still the workshop tomorrow but uh, you know it's the end of the talk program uh, so uh, first I really want to thank all the speakers uh, uh, the last panel was really wonderful and uh, you know we really put our heart into that and I really thank you for this because you know I know so much uh, you struggle every day for the things you do uh, and uh, uh, we want to thank all the speakers of today and uh, the speaker of yesterday's and then we want to thank our team so um, I will do now a list of thanks, so <laughs> don't get too bored, but also this is really important. Um, Daniela Silvestrin, Nana Bakker, Monty Harmony as project managers, and the Jonas Franchi, the visual designers, um, and also the crazy tweet uh, person that has been tweeting <laughs> uh, forever in these days and before. Uh, and uh, no, not really crazy tweet person, but I mean, he used uh, uh, very active uh, <laughs> because he used Twitter in a really, you know, uh, engaged way. Uh, then uh, Joe Averman for the SPR manager. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Elisabeth Enke for the wonderful uh, uh, sounds. Uh, technician work. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> and uh, Thorsten also that uh, is working at uh, our technology support. Uh, then Angel, Gonzalo and Gabriel that are our video team. Uh, Maria Silvano for the photo. Where is Maria? I don't see her, but ah, over there. Ah, you are in front of me. And uh, uh, the streaming uh, boiling heads. Thank you. Um, and uh, the volunteers that have been working with us, uh, Giacomo Marinsalta and also uh, Lauren De Carli that is helping us with the editorial tasks. And uh, finally, the helpers that are building up the space and taking it down and the cash desk uh, helper, uh, Giorgio. So I think we say them all, hopefully. And uh, so we will meet tomorrow for the people that uh, will be at the workshop and uh, please come back uh, middle June here and you can follow us on uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook and whatever, all the you know, platform that we don't like so much but still we have to use them. Uh, and uh, of course in a week or a bit more there will be the videos of the talks. Thank you very much. <laughs>